this. <laughs> Glad you're here today. We continue our More Than Conquerors series, and if you've not been here, it's your first time, this is a series taking a look at the book of Revelation. Um, this is part three of that, so to kind of catch us up a little bit. Last week, we looked at chapters four through seven. In chapter five, we saw the throne of God, and keep in mind what the Revelation is all about is encouraging Christians. It's helping us to just be ready for whatever happens in life. Uh, there's a lot of bad stuff that goes on in this world. We live in a fallen world. It will continue to be like that. Even tragic things happen to Christians. But over and over again, God is reminding us in this revelation that he's in control. He's in charge. He's on the throne. He's always with us. And he's going to be victorious no matter what. And we want to remain faithful. We want to be on his side whenever the end comes, whether it's the end of my life, whether it's the return of Jesus, either way it works out the same, but I want to be faithful to the Lord whenever that time does take place. In looking at the throne of God, we saw a scroll, and with this scroll a lamb came, who is Jesus, and Jesus was worthy and able to open the seals. So last week we looked at the seven seals, and in that, we saw a picture of, both from the time of the revelation until Jesus returns, that again, God's judgment is going to take place. Jesus is the one who opened the seals. He is the one who allowed the horsemen to come. And so again, in all of it, God is in control. There's good things that happen. There's bad things that happen. There's judgment that's going to take place. God protects his church. But again, no matter what, God's in control. In that unit, we're calling it, or if you want to call it the, a cycle, chapters 4 through 7, you see this good, bad stuff happening. We're reminded of God protecting his church, God bringing judgment. But then the second coming takes place. Then judgment happens. The bad were dealt with. The good were dealt with. And then the end of time. You see in Revelation 6, 15 and 16, the bad people as they're dealt with, they're trying to hide from God's judgment. And the last part there says, For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Then right after this, a description is given of the good. And John sees the 144,000. He also tells about a great multitude that he sees that he sees around the throne of God. But then notice the description in verses 15 through 17 that these people in this great multitude are around God's throne. They're worshiping him. But look at the condition that they're in. And again, this is the same thing we'll see at the end of the revelation. And what I want you to start thinking, if you haven't already, is revelation is not one continuous picture at point A and takes us to point B, and it's just all in chronological order, but rather the revelation tells us the same story from different perspectives, but the same story over and over again. So what we'll see today as we look at the trumpets is the trumpets is a repeat of the seven seals. Later, the bowls will be a repeat of the seven trumpets, a repeat of the seven seals. And so you get the same cycle or the same period of time, and we'll kind of sort of validate that, saying some things we'll see in the text today. But you notice the description here, never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst, the sun will not beat upon them, the lamb center the throne, he will lead them springs of living water, God will wipe every tear from their eyes. So kind of abbreviated version there to quickly go through it. But it's the same thing we'll see later in Revelation. And so again, you have history unfolding, good and bad happening, God judging, God protecting his church, the second coming taking place, judgment happening, the eternal destination of those who are condemned, the eternal destination of those who go to heaven, and then it brings us to this week. Then we come to part three, and part three is chapters 8 through 11. So you want to write that down now or mark that. And again, this is such an abbreviated look at these things. So I encourage you, the weeks after we do the message, that you go back and you read these chapters, and hopefully they make a little bit more sense. And then you read the whole revelation or whatever. The whole point of this is not to confuse Christians. 
The whole point of the revelation is for it to be a blessing and to be a source of comfort. You know, as we wonder, how long, God? You know, how messed up is this world going to get? You know, how bad are Christians going to be treated? How much do I have to go through? And so as we cry out to God, God is giving an answer to people who make that petition or plea to Him. It's not going to be very long, is what He says. But He's in control no matter what happens. He's going to be victorious. You want to be faithful. You want to be on His side. Now the message for today is God is for us. And so that's what I'm kind of calling this third unit or this third cycle. And so we pick up in Revelation chapter 8. So the seventh seal or the last of the seals we see here, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. And so this silence, we don't know if it was so John could take a break, that he needed a rest you know, with everything that's going on and happening with him. Or you know, is this silence for the purpose of just getting people's attention and just kind of building anticipation for the next thing that's going to happen in the revelation? You know, we, we're not told why, but this gives us a definite break from the last unit of chapters 5, 4 through 8, 5 through 7, 4 through 7. There we go. I'll just make up numbers. But chapters 4 through 7, and it gives us a break from that cycle as we go into this next cycle. It says, Then John tells us what he saw in verse 2. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Again, it's subtle, but it's throughout. God's the one that gives them the trumpets. So what's about to happen and what's about to unfold, it doesn't happen unless God allows it to. So God gives the trumpets to the seven angels. Then verse 3, another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of the saints on the golden altar before the throne. Now remember with the seals, the fifth seal, we got a picture of the saints under the altar. And literally, this is not their geographic location, but this is symbolism for these are people who are in a right relationship with God. Now, they've been killed during the tribulation. You know, they've been martyred. They've been put to death because of their faith. And they're there under the altar crying out, how long? You know, how long is this going to go on? How many people you know, are going to die who are people of faith? Now, in this cycle, we see the saints. So this is us. We're, we're not dead yet, but we're able to pray. We're offering up prayers, just like the church has been for the last 1,900, 2,000 years. Church going forward offers up prayers. The thing I want you to notice is our prayers, it's, it's not idle chatter. That our prayers are important. That the saints' prayers they have an impact upon God. They have an impact upon the timing of things taking place in our world and even in regards to the end times. So the smoke of the incense together with the prayers of the saints went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Now we're not praying for God. It's sometimes it's sort of like a sporting event. You know, we're really pulling for a team and it's just like just kill the other team. But we really don't mean kill the other team, but we really want to, we want to squash them, you know, through the course of this sporting event. Well, as Christians, you know, we don't want people to die not knowing the Lord. But at the same time, we're sympathetic to our brothers and sisters who are being martyred because of their faith. We don't want that to happen, and so we pray for them, we pray on their behalf, and if necessary, justice needs to be served in those circumstances, God's protection, whatever that may look like. But also for us as Christians, this is not just a prayer of God, stick it to them, you know, and let them have it. But rather, what's being sought here is vindication. You know, for us as Christians, you know, people all the time are like, I mean, you can't prove God exists. You know, show me God. You know, and just little things like that where people say stuff to us. And so, you know, it's at that moment, it's like, 
God, if you could send a lightning bolt, it doesn't have to hit them, but if it hits really, really close to them. So we don't want something bad to happen to them, but it's just like, how could I be vindicated in this moment? That I'm not crazy because of my faith. And so that's sort of the idea here of God, you know, show people that you are God. You know, we've been telling them that you're God. And so God, you know, sort of help us out. But also God will let you be God. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells a parable about the persistent widow. And in that prayer, notice he says, And God will not bring about justice, or rather, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? You remember, this is about this lady persistently kept going back to the judge. And God, or Jesus rather, is likening that to us praying to God. And again, the idea here is for vindication for Christians. And so we need to keep praying. And you know, we can keep praying for Jesus to come back. We can pray for lost people that we know to come to know the Lord. You know, that's the ideal, that they know the Lord before it's too late. We can pray for people who are our enemies, and who they've declared themselves as our enemies, and they're enemies of the church. And so, but God, just vindicate us. Now back to the Revelation, verse number 7, we come to the trumpets. So the angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down upon the earth. Now the thing to notice as we go through the trumpets is there's a lot of similarities to the plagues that God used in Egypt. So this would be something that the people would understand. And a lot of the symbolism here, people in the first century, they would have got it a lot easier than we do as far as the symbolism, what it meant in their day, and how to apply it. But the thing for us is, is because symbolism is used, it makes it just as real for us. Even though I may not read it and grasp it as quickly as they did then, Still, the symbolism makes it applicable to now. See, God, he knew, and he could have said, you know, the Roman Emperor Nero is going to do such and such, and the Roman Emperor Domitian is going to do such and such. You know, and a people group from the north, you know, the Germanic tribes, you know. You know he, God knew, and he could have done that and told us specifics, but since there's not specifics, what we're able to do, whether we live in AD 1000, or AD 1500, or AD 2018, or AD 100, that we read these symbols, and then we step back and we look at the world around us, and we're able to see the unfolding of the events of the revelation in the world around us. So all the stuff that we'll read about, it happened in AD 100. It happened a thousand years ago. It happens today. But the message is, no matter what happens, God's in control. He's got you. He's going to win. When this is all over, he's going to be victorious. Over and over again, you see victory for God and for the people who are faithful to God. You want to be on God's side. You want to hang in there. You want to remain faithful. That's the message. And that's it, plain and simple, over and over again. So that's how we as Christians are blessed when we read the Revelation. We don't, again, I've said this already in the series, but we don't need the book of Revelation to tell us bad stuff happens. You know, every one of us, we've lived long enough, we know. We see it on the news all the time, we've experienced in our own families, in our own lives, horrible things, tough things happened, but God's in control. He's with us all the time. All right. Second, oh no, stay with the first angel. So the first angel, we see plagues kind of mixed in. Uh, we'll see this as we go through these things. But then a third of the earth was burned up. A third of the trees were burned up. So what we have here is God's judgment. And we'll, we'll nail that down even more in just a little bit. But God's judgment, but it's limited. It's only a third. But again, don't get caught up in literal stuff. 
you know, we don't need to go out and like, ah, it looks like he went over, it's like a fourth or it's a fifth, well, it went under for a fourth, but you know, both of those were under, weren't they? Or half, <laughs> it's like a, not a math major, theology major, so. No. <laughs> anyway, it's a limited judgment, and the goal of this, we're also gonna see, is repentance. So with this first trumpet, we see vegetation, in essence, is what's attacked. And so, especially what comes to mind is like, say, periods of famine. We probably feel that faster than anything else. You know, if we lost all the trees and don't have oxygen, that's, you know, that's going to be pretty rough, probably surviving that. But, but more, more realistic for us, we've sort of experienced is a lack of food or famine. Or we can see places in the world that experience this right now. The second angel, he sounded his trumpet, something like a huge mountain, all ablaze, was thrown into the sea. So again, we don't need to think of a literal mountain being thrown into the sea, but how much more disruptive to the sea could you get, you know, than taking a mountain and throwing it into the sea? And so that's the idea here, is just a great commotion that disturbs the ocean, or at least the salt water part of the planet. A third of the sea turned to blood, a third of the living creatures, they're affected. So again, it's a limited judgment, and then this time, it's on salt water, we'll call it. It's on the oceans. The third angel sounded his trumpet and saw a great star blazing like a torch fall from the sky on a third of the rivers on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. You know, probably out of all of the proper names in Revelation, you've heard Wormwood more than anything. Uh, you know, it's like, ah, oh, it's Chernobyl. If you take Chernobyl and you go back to such and such and you twist it around and do this, it means the same thing as Wormwood. And it's like, you know, that... That's good, but we spend so much time trying to figure out what wormwood is that we miss the point of what's being said. You know, at the end of the day, it's like, I nailed it down. Well, you know what, in AD 100, they probably had a case where fresh water was messed up and poisoned somewhere, and somehow the word wormwood, which just means bitter, it's turned bad. It's just not good for consumption anymore. It's not usable. But with this one, we see that it's a limited judgment but it's on fresh water. So we've got oceans, we've got vegetation, we've got fresh water. The fourth angel, this one, I have to say honestly, it's, it's a little bit tougher to nail down as far as what's meant. It, it's celestial bodies. I don't know how this one works. It says, before the angel sounded his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, a third of the stars, so that a third of them were turned dark. A third of the day was without light and also a third of the night. Now, to me, all four of these, you know, I, I can think of at least one uh, natural occurrence that all of these would happen as a result of, and that is if you had a really bad volcanic eruption. Because it would block out the sky, uh, it would mess up the water supply, vegetation would be affected and destroyed. Well, again, you know, there's been volcanoes erupting, and you can go all the way back to, you know, in the first century, they were familiar with some pretty bad events, you know, related to volcanoes. Uh, I'm not saying that's it or it's only that. I just don't know with this one as far as consistently. But anyway, uh, it's celestial bodies, though, that we're told that are affected. So we got oceans, vegetation, fresh water, celestial bodies. And the reason that I point that out is the second part of this, verse 12 and 13, says, As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in midair call out in a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of earth because of the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. Now these first four, I'm thinking, they sound kind of bad, even though they're limited. Uh, it's you know fresh water, salt water, uh, celestial bodies, vegetation. Still, you know, famine, not having fresh water. You know, those, those things seem rough. You know, it, it's, it's just struck me. I think of during the week. You know, we just had a hurricane uh, hit you know the coast of Florida, and now in the aftermath of the hurricane, you know, you already had a deluge of salt water, but the problems that they've got at this point is they don't have food. And they don't have water. Uh, those are the things that they need faster than anything. You know, electricity be great. Building, rebuilding your house is great. You know, finding possessions, but you got to have water pretty much right away. And soon you got to have food. Uh, and you know, and hopefully we're able to get that in there uh, in a timely manner. But as bad as the first four are, 
they're warned, you know, the next ones are going to be even worse than the first four. So then we come to the fifth angel, chapter 9. The thing I want you to notice with this is the last three trumpets, it deals with people. So people are affected directly. Now, indirectly, we're affected by the ocean, vegetation, fresh water, those kind of things. But now we're affected directly. It says, the fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. And so here, we guess it's, it's an angelic being. It's a fallen angel, whatever. But they are now, you know, they've been kicked out, if, we, if you will. They've fallen to earth. They're given the key to the abyss. When they opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. You can keep it. This is symbolism. And so again, we don't, you know, it's like, oh, where's the abyss? And how deep is the abyss? And maybe the abyss is bottomless. And what's at the bottom? You know, we can talk about that all day long. And even when we figure it out, we won't know for sure if we figured it out and we haven't accomplished anything. But the point that we need to get from this is we're talking demonic activity now. So we're starting to move, you know, when we looked at the seals, when we looked at the first of the trumpets, it's like physical judgments, physical things that can happen to us and physical things that happen in the world. Now we're starting to transition to really what's more dangerous, and that is spiritual attacks. Now again, spiritual beings, the demons can impact the physical, but the worst thing they can do is impact the spiritual. And, and cause us to fall away from God uh, and for people who are in sin to want to stay in sin. Uh, but what we're going to see with these trumpets, though, is they're used by God additionally as a form of judgment on people. But there's a goal with this. So when he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. And out of the smoke, locusts came down upon the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. Now, again, this is another one that was like, ooh, locusts. Those are Apache helicopters, you know, or Black Hawk. You know, I know my whole life I've always heard what people have tried to figure out what the locusts are. The locust is simply a way of telling it they're demonic beings. We get caught up in looking, and I think that's a, an important challenge for us as Christians. I think a lot of the stuff as we go through the Revelation is talking about spiritual attacks but we spend so much time looking for, ooh, you know, is this Russia? And is Russia attacking Israel? Is it the United Nations? And we look at sort of these physical things, and all the while, our morals are just slipping and going down the toilet. You know, I've said before, I wonder if the Apostle Paul or Peter hung out with me for a week, and they listened to me talk, and they knew the stuff that I thought about, or that I watched on television, or watched in the media, uh, where I ate, I don't know, how much I ate. You know, if they spent time with me during the course of a week, you know, would they even consider me a Christian? And yet I look at myself and think, I, I think I'm a pretty good Christian. You know, I know I'm completely dependent on the grace of God for salvation, but at the same time, I should pat myself on the back a little bit. I think I'm, you know, I'm a pretty good guy. But, you know, how far have I sort of lowered the bar spiritually? And again, it's such a subtle attack that there are things that I, like, it's okay with me, you know, if I do that. Whereas if I still went and asked my mom, she'd say, no, you're a Christian. What in the world are you thinking? Why would you do that? You know, why would you eat that or go there or say that? You know, so again, the danger force, I think, are the spiritual attacks that oftentimes we're like, oh, I hope, you know, I, I hope our country, you know, we don't go through times of persecution while we live here. And I'm with you on that. But is Satan the great deceiver? Is he more subtle in his attacks? Because he doesn't want us while we're here on this earth. He wants us separated from God forever. And that's his goal. And that's what he's working at. So anyway, so these are demonic beings that we're talking about. Again, it's symbolism. So the locusts, they're able to sting like scorpions. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So we begin to see here, even demons, they're used by God 
to judge people who are not Christians. Now again, are these people who are really Christians or are they people who just say they're Christians? You know, and that's, that's sort of a challenge for us. So anyway, the demons, they're an instrument of judgment from God. They were given power to kill them, or rather they were not given power to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. So we see that their work of judgment, it's limited. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of a scorpion when it strikes a man. During those days, men will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. Now, the sixth angel I didn't put on the screen. You'll have to read Revelation 9 because it's a big section of chapter 9. But to shorten up the sixth angel, and when he blows a trumpet, it results in death. And so it, he's the worst one of all. Uh, one third of mankind die. So again, it's limited, but people die at the hands of the demonic. Again, look through the last 2,000 years and even today. You know, there are you know, indigenous religions all over the place that are various forms of black magic and spiritism. You know, demonic activity is alive and well in the world these days. You know, people, they destroy their bodies, they destroy each other's bodies and mutilate them. There's cannibalism associated with it. People are put to death. And so it, this is not just new. This was happening even 2,000 years ago. So again, the 8,100, 81,000, 80, 2018. Again, people can look around the world and see the activities that the trumpets are talking about and the judgment that's happening with those. Then we come to verses 20 and 21. The rest of mankind that were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols they cannot see or hear, nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. See, the goal of the judgment is repentance. You know, Peter tells us God, he's patient with us, not wanting anyone to perish, but that everyone come to repentance. But you know, if I lived, a, if I had a perfect life, would I feel the need to repent? Or because of when I go through challenges and hardships, it brings me back to God. You know, if every day at the beach is sunny, or if there's a tsunami on the way, on which of those occasions am I more likely to acknowledge and hopefully rely on the existence of God? You know, they say there's no such thing as an atheist in a foxhole. See, God is aware we're only here for a little while. And this little while, while we're here, we get to choose, do I want God forever? Or do I reject God and then I have the consequences of that forever? But eternal life is what he offers to us. And that's what Jesus died to give to us. And so his goal, even though we have chosen to sin over and over and over, and any one of those separates us from God forever. So even with that choice, even with living in a fallen world and that we've messed up, God still wants us and gives us the opportunity to come back to him. To overcome every bit of this, he makes it possible. But then we come to chapter 10. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down. And this just tells us just how big, how massive this angel is. This angel has a little scroll. Then we move on. When he shouted, that is the angel, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. We don't know what the seven thunders are. We can speculate as to what they are and why John was told not to write it down. You know, it may have been that we couldn't understand it. Uh, it may have been that God decided, you know what, that's not going to happen. Change my mind. There's already enough judgment or whatever. Or, and I think this is the most valid, it lets us know that we don't know everything. 
You know, I think people come to the book of Revelation and, and you get the idea, you can go to seminars and it's like, we can tell you every last thing that's going to happen right up until when Jesus comes and Jesus is going to come on this date at this time. You know, that contradicts the other parts of the Bible. But people sort of precisely kind of like name what everything is in the book of Revelation. Again, God could have done that already. He used symbols so it's applicable to Christians no matter when or where they live. And so I think the thunders being kind of sealed up, it not recorded, it's just telling us we don't know what everything in the Revelation is, and it's okay. God lets us know that we don't know everything in the Revelation. The thing we want to take away from it is in the forest, not the trees. And the forest is God wins, God's in control, God's always with us. You want to be on God's side. And if you are, you win too. Then verse 8, Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me once more, Go take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, Take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. So I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. So it's, it's bittersweet. We don't know what this scroll is. Some suggestions are it's the Bible. It's the gospel message. Uh, one possibility is it's chapter 11 that we're about to look at. And really all three of those, whether it's the Bible or the gospel portions of the Bible, or even chapter 11 of the Revelation, there's good and bad. So there's good things that happen to people who are faithful. There's bad things that happen to people who aren't faithful. Uh, or we could say people who are faithful, there's good things that happen. you got eternal life. you got a relationship with God that lasts forever. But also there's a tribulation. You know, Christians die. Christians are put to death because of their faith. And so yet you're a believer and you have the best and greatest relationship in the world, but that relationship also costs you your life. And so again, we don't know exactly what the little scroll is, but all of these things I think kind of give us the idea. I like the idea that it's chapter 11. And so we move into chapter 11. It's a new vision that we have here, the first two verses. John says, I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the worshipers there. And the idea of this is God's protection being provided for his people. But exclude the outer court so they're not going to fall under God's protection. It says, do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. Now that 42 months, we'll see that time frame, and what that represents is from the time the Revelation was written until Jesus returns. And the three different ways that you'll see it is 42 months, or 1,260 days. So if you take 42 months, multiply it times 30 days in a month, then you get the 1,260, or time times and half a time. So time would be one year times is that plural, so that's two, so one plus two is three, and a half a time, it's three and a half. So three and a half years, or 42 months, or 1,260 days. And so you'll see these different time references, but all of those represent the same period of time, and from John's writing of the Revelation until the second coming of Jesus. So the first one we have is, it says 42 months here, that the temple is measured, God's people are protected, but then the outer courts, they're being trampled by the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. Then verse 3, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days. So there's that time period again, the time that the two witnesses prophesy, 1,260 days, or the same as 42 months or three and a half years. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devour, devours their enemies. Now, I believe that the two witnesses, they represent the church. 
And specifically, they represent the church in its mission efforts as far as doing evangelism and going out and sharing the gospel with people. Again, it's symbolism. So before any of us get the idea of, you know what, I think if I could do that, I could be one of the Avengers. You know, if I had the ability for fire to come out of my mouth and consume people, yeah, that's kind of happening. You know, and so that's sort of exciting to be able to have that ability. But again, the power of the truth, the power of God's message, but also there's something even more here that the God's talking about. And that, again, God is protecting his church. You remember what Jesus said when Peter, he confessed him, said, you know, you're the Christ, Son of the living God. And Jesus said, you know, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it or not even overcome it. So physical world nor the spiritual world can overcome Jesus' church. It's protected by Jesus. It's his bride. And so the two witnesses or the church, they're going to accomplish their mission and their task. And anybody that tries to stop them, we see they're going to be judged. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. But then notice, though, now when they finish their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. And so Christians accomplish their mission, but also Christians can be put to death. Now, the interpretation here, again, is this a one-time event, or is it two witnesses multiple times, or is this just a recurring thing, and again, the two represent the church? And I believe, because it says the 1260 days that the two witnesses, you know, they're prophesying, I think it represents the church. Uh, we go out in twos. Um, two also significant, it brings to mind uh, Moses and Elijah. You know, they're with Jesus. It says the two lampstands. Uh, and this, this was in the previous slide, so I kind of left this out uh, when I was there. If you want to back up, Gene. So you got the two lampstands. This goes back to Zechariah and the vision that he has about with the kingdom of God. But you've got these oil lamps, and they're sort of plugged directly into olive trees. So kind of the idea there, the Holy Spirit uh, is the one who gives, I guess, life to the church. And so the lamps can burn forever because they're plugged right into the tree. Uh, and so it represents the church. It represents us. And so again, for people in the first century, they're reading this, and immediately the two, they think, well, who's those? You know, is that, who's the two? Was well, that Peter and Paul? Well, yes. You know, is it you know Paul and Mary or Jim and Shirley? Yes. But it's the Wilbur Christian Church. It's so again, it's the church during the 1260 days. So we go back to seven through ten. So after they're killed, their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom in Egypt, and where the Lord was crucified. So they're hated. It's a dishonor for their bodies to be left out like this. Sodom represents immorality. Egypt represents bondage or oppression. Uh, and so that's how the world sees us, how the world hates us. Next, for three and a half days. So it's a very short period of time relative to the 1260 days. But for a very short time, people from every tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets have tormented those who live on the earth. See, we see this sort of playing out in our society today. You know, when you preach and teach truth, people hate it. People hate you. People don't want to be told that sin is sin. You know, so we've sort of gotten rid of sin in our society. And so anybody that comes along and says, you know what, the Bible says that's sin. And what does our society say? That's hate speech. You can't do that. And then anybody who does this hate speech, if you're shown in some way to be corrupt, or if you're smeared, you know, so if a minister, you know, gets kicked out of the ministry, if a church gets closed down, if somebody who's proclaiming the truth gets silenced, what does the world do? They all celebrate and cheer. They high-five each other. They've destroyed this person who made their lives miserable because they pointed out sin and pointed out guilt. 
See, people, we're the same way. We're tempted to do this. I want to somehow figure out how can I do my sin and enjoy it and not feel bad about it. But at the same time, I'm so thankful that God doesn't let me do that. Because I lose eternity if I choose the delight for a little while rather than the relationship with God forever. But if you don't know God, you just want to hold on to the sin. So let me have my sin and please don't make me feel bad with your hate speech. Tell what we're going to put you in jail because you hate speech because we don't want you to do it anymore. So it's already playing out. Well, and this is not the first time that it's happened. It's already happened in Europe. It's happened in other countries with different types of governments and leadership of the countries. And we can go back historically, and the same type of thing has happened. Verse 11, but after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. So again, I say, our choices are, this is a one-time event, and it happens at the very end, that the church as a whole is just stopped. And in essence, it dies, but then it's in, in a way resurrected and called up to be with the Lord. Or it's a repeated event where congregations or the church looks like it died. So again, we, and you can go back in time to church history in different cultures and societies. You know, there's a point in time the church it flourished and was ready to explode in China. And then government changed, the church was squashed. But now China is one of the places where the church is growing the fastest. Your places like Iran, the church grew and flourished. Then other religions came in, it was squashed. Today, it's like the church has been resurrected. And again, Iran, the church is growing faster there than it's growing in many places in the world. Again, people are tortured and they're persecuted, and it's one of the roughest places in the world to be a Christian. You know, Indonesia, China, North Korea, Iran. But these are the places where the church is growing the fastest. There was a point where it looked like it was dead. So again, is that what's being talked about here? Whatever it is, the church though is protected by God. So Christians die. We still go to heaven. You know, it's okay. God's in control. But then the last part there, at that very hour there was a severe earthquake and a tenth of the city collapsed. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. There's consequences. If you're going to persecute and kill Christians, there's consequences. God's going to pour out his wrath on you at some point in time. And again, go back through church history and look at the groups who were the most vicious in the treatment of Christians, they were gone eventually. They were wiped out. They were destroyed. There were consequences that they suffered to believe were God's judgment for how they treated the church. But the thing to notice there is people gave glory to God, but they still didn't repent of their sins. And so they still had a problem. Romans chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, Paul tells us, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? See, God is for us. Now again, that's not license to say, Ooh, I'm on God's side, or God's on my side, and so I'm right and you're wrong, and then we go out and tell everybody that. Again, as a faithful person who acknowledges God's grace and our dependence on God, that's what God desires. Humility and reliance on Him. And that puts us on God's side. And if you're on God's side, who can be against you? They can kill you. They can take your possessions. But you still got God forever. So, so far in the Revelation, the first unit which involve the letters to the churches, chapters 1 through 3, we learn that Jesus is with us always. So again, yeah, that's good news to be reminded of that. Jesus is with his church. He walks around among the lampstands. Chapters 4 through 7, the seals. God is in control. But with that, you go through church history, good and bad, judgment, heaven and hell. Then chapters 8 through 11, the trumpets. God is for us. And we see there's God's judgment. 
There's good and bad. God protects his church. Jesus returns. There's heaven and hell. And that brings us to the last part. And that's the seventh angel, verses 15 through 18. It says, The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of God has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Maybe that one little part there sounds familiar. That's from the Hallelujah Chorus, uh, Handel. Uh, and so, anyway, that's part of that. And the 24 elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was. And you notice what's missing there? Who is to come. And who is to come. Because Jesus has come. So again, in this cycle, we have the return of Jesus, and now we have judgment, and we have heaven and hell. It says, The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and your saints and those who reverence your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. And then that brings us to the end of this third cycle. Again, telling us the same story. But the good news is, for us as Christians who are on God's side, God is victorious, and we're promised victory if we're with God. He's with us always. God is in control. He's the one on the throne. God is for us. So, yeah. Bad stuff's going to happen. You don't need the revelation to tell you that. You just look around. Just live a little while longer. Bad stuff happens, even to Christians. God's in control.